Hello folks. One of the things I'm working on is a print slash embed thing for the quality of life project. And it's at a stage where it's mostly done. So I thought I'd do a quick show and tell and tell you where that code's at. I'm doing this as a separate project and a separate GitHub repo from the quality of life project for two reasons. One, I want the original project code to remain fairly clean. So this is probably how I'll do stuff like this in the future as separate projects. Second reason is I wanted to do this with the tooling and techniques I use now versus what I was doing several years ago, which is what the current project is. And I guess there's a third reason too. I wanted to use some of the tools to see how they work for a future overhaul refactoring of the quality of life project. So this is a whole separate GitHub repo. I recently, for the Quality of Life Project, had a number of great contributions from Tim Stallman out of Durham. And one of his ideas was to make the data folder with some of the configuration information a whole separate GitHub repo. So you would, you know, git pull the Quality of Life Project, and then you git pull whatever data set and configuration you want to work with. And then you fire it up and it works with whatever data you just pulled. That makes it very easy to do stuff like this, where this is part of the quality of life umbrella, but it's a whole different project. I'm just get pulling that data. And then when I transform the data for this project, I do it in a different way than I do for the main project, because this has different needs. Makes all that very easy. It has a number of very good contributions that, that Tim made. So I owe Tim beer. Anyway, let's do a little quick show and tell, enough blabbering. Very simple layout. It comes out like this with this pound triple C print background sort of gray. You got two options. You can print. As you can see here from the preview, it prints very pretty. Or you can embed. And this is your embed code. If you change the map focus, you'll see up here it's changing the bounding box for the map for your embed. And it's taking a number of arguments we'll look at. You can change the name of your print or your embed, and it will factor in right over here. And when you go to embed this, it'll look kind of like this. This is one with some parcels selected and already zoomed into a different bounding box. And of course, where it's embedded it is also still a fully interactive map. Now credit where credit is due, this whole, I, I needed something that looked good for printing but was very compact for a smaller size for embedding. In terms of a title and subtitle information that includes a year and the units and a, a legend for the choropleth. And I got this whole thing from this example of data-driven styling from Mapbox. Well, this was really cool. They do it a little bit different in the middle sections of highlighting. What I didn't like about what they did is this number right in the middle of the chart. I can't tell what that number means. I don't know if it's this first, that's where the numbers start, or that's where this category finishes. So you don't know whether this is 120K plus, or it's 100 to 120K in this one. I don't know what those numbers mean. So. I shifted those over so they are aligned with the boundary on the left side of the box. So you can tell what that number means. That's the only thing I changed there, but I thought that was kind of important because I did it first like this and I went, say, what exactly is this box? So that's how it works. That's what it looks like. Now let's look how it's built. First, this iframe right here on the print page, this is also an iframe. It is the very same iframe source. So this print page is like an index.html and embed.html is the iframe and this is an iframe. So you're not seeing a print map and then something in an iframe over here that are different things. They're the same thing. That cuts down on a lot of coding. Let's see, let's look at code. Everybody loves code. Where's my code? Ah, here's my code. So, where are we going to start here? Here's the index HTML. I'll make this bigger for you. It's just your standard stuff. It's got a print button. 
Oh, I should mention, let's see. No, not that. That. Zero WCAG two double A errors. I don't think I've ever done that before. Awesome. Code. See, there's not a whole lot here. It's basically setting up an iframe area, which we're setting the source from the arguments, and then just a little form stuff. And for the CSS, it's doing a little bit of hiding when you print. Now the print, uh, see every thing, time I do a print thing, I learn more about printing in CSS. There is an at page directive, I didn't realize, where you can set what a print page size is and what the print margins are. That makes it very easy to set up an exact layout. So you're not going to get surprised when you go to print. One of the things you can do in units in CSS, which I knew but I hadn't really thought about in this context, is your units can be inches. So you can set it up to be perfectly the right size. And uh, this is all, there's a MDN, of course, has the best documentation on anything. And tell you all about the page rule for setting properties when you go to print a document. But that was very, very handy. So it sets up the exact size. So that map is about the exact size to print on eight and a half by 11. Then when it goes to do media print, it just hides that header and it takes away all the margins and so forth on the, the embed, which is the iframe portion. And then that print fits exactly in the page along with a little border around it. So that was super, super easy to make a print. I mean, see, I didn't even bother modularizing the CSS because there's under 100 lines. Uh, embed JS, all it's uh, actually app JS is what that page is running. It's just taking these parameters, a bounding box, anything you want selected, the metric number, which is a thing in the data configuration, the year, the title, and that's pretty much all the things that you want. It's using a, a, a window on message to and window post message to communicate back and forth with the iframe. So when I change the title here, it's communicating back here with this iframe. When I change the zoom over here, you see this bounding box up here change is communicating back to the parent. So that's how that communication is happening. Very simple setup. Now the embed HTML, which is what's in this iframe and is which is in your embed as well, is kind of cool. Let's see if I can get over to it. This is pretty much all the page code. We've got a map. We've got this attribution at the bottom. And we've got this custom element, table of contents. One of the things I want to look into for a future quality of life overhaul is a component system of some sort. I've been big into React. Um, GeoPortal is all done in React now. React is really awesome for components like this, but there are parts of it that feel kind of science project-y and uh, a bit unfriendly. It's, it's more good than bad, but there are things that could be better. And I ran across Vue. Vue.js is a component kind of architecture like React. It's kind of like they took the best parts of React, which are many, and the best parts of Angular, which are few, and blended them together. And it is the easiest to use component sort of library that I've tried yet. And I'm using Vue for this. Now this particular project doesn't really need Vue for that because once you set this once, it's not going to change. Although we are changing the title here, that's not really that big a deal though. But that's a component I'm planning on using in the quality of life project. So I'll be able to take that straight over and use it right there. So that way when variables uh, when metrics and years and legend keys are changing all the time, I can just set something and, and off it goes. What that looks like, a view component. 
it's really kind of neat because it's all in one thing. The view component has your styling for that particular thing. We've got a template and it uses kind of a mustache sort of syntax for that. And it's, it's kind of neat. These are just putting in data elements. Here we're doing if units is not null, put units there. If not, it won't. We're setting, saying here we're going to take the first element of that breaks array, and then we're going to apply a filter to it. So it's it's very robust templating syntax. Then you go down into your JavaScript. See all we're doing here is we're setting our name, table of contents, and this filter is what takes a number and to make a legend like this, you have to control the length your numbers can get. So what it does is if it's over a thousand, it applies, it rounds off to like 1.34 and puts a K at the end. If it were a million, it'd be an M, a billion, it'd be a B. And I think it does trillion too. It's this little bit of the code I found on Stack Overflow. So to make a legend like this, you can't have a number running away from you. So that's that's what that's that's what that filter is. You can see there's very little code here. Mostly it's just this template. What you do over on the code side, and this is for the embed, and almost all of these are my stuff. So I don't think there's a million weird dependencies. The only things that aren't mine are view and Mapbox, Mapbox GL, and Axios for fetching stuff. And the X6 promise polyfill for Axios for IE11. And Jinx Breaks is from Atomic Right. Okay, maybe it's not all my stuff, but it's not like a hundred different weird dependencies. The JavaScript gzipped for the whole thing, including GL and view and everything was 200 something kilobytes. Not too bad. So we're getting these same arguments and these are coming from the embed. It's just coming from the iframe uh, source is getting those arguments for the bounds and metric number and what have you. I'm setting some defaults so it'll actually draw something if you didn't send the proper stuff. Here's our uh, parent and child communication. Now this app data, this all gets passed to your view component. And a view component, uh, view components can share the same data. So I could set one bit of data like this and set my breaks from the Jenks breaks of my data set. And anything, if I have that legend, if I have a bar chart or something else, and it's using that same data as part of its data source, as soon as that changes, they all change. They all run their stuff, which is really nice. In this case, it's just the one component. So, show you an example of that. We'll just put this on here for debugging. So now that app data is shared. Let's see, it always defaults to the wrong thing. Let's see. App data dot title equals hi there. You see, we just changed a JSON object and it updated this title. So that's super cool. And then it's just getting fetching our data and doing our stuff. It's fetching the geography as GeoJSON and fetching the data as JSON. And then it's merging those things together before it adds it to GLJS. Now, GLJS I've done as an ES6 class, not as a component. The reason is there's nothing really template about the map. There's nothing there that I'm going to replace a value based on a data change. I'd have to do all these sort of artificial, when this thing data updates, go run some function to do something to the map rather than component-y sort of stuff. So it didn't make a whole lot of sense. It's just an ES6 class. It's got a create map function and initializes the neighborhoods and adds the layer. If you have anything selected, it will highlight those. You see in, if you looked at the 
iframe code here, you'd see there's an S argument with these four neighborhoods selected. Those four neighborhoods ID, IDs were passed. Oh, we're uh, setting our neighborhood line selected filter. So when you pass in a choropleth map, it's going to do all the breaks. It's going to add that. First time you run, it sets up the map and it draws, it adds the GeoJSON layer and it adds the breaks and color information and it draws it. The next time, if you were in an app where you're going to change to a different data set, you wouldn't in this, but you will in the main project later, you will simply change, get the GeoJSON again, update the values on the new values you just had coming in and then set that as the data source for that layer and then change the breaks and colors for that particular layer style and then off it goes and it draws it again. So, see this is very simple and the great thing about doing this in an ES6 class there's nothing at all in the application anywhere else that calls a mapping function directly. It's all in this one class which is 150 lines of code. So if Mapbox who knows what a uh, map box holodeck comes out or I something goes really bad and I'm going I'm going to leaflet anything like that happens I change this one file the things that are calling it are passing it arguments that they would in all likelihood be passing in anyway to any mapping library uh, center point zoom level all that kind of stuff so it makes it very easy to swap out a mapping library whenever you need to so that's why that's an ES6 class. It also makes the code very neat and manageable. Anyway, I will put a link to uh, this project on GitHub. It is mostly done. I will do the thing I do where I like move a font back and forth a couple pixels at a time and, and see which I like better. And I have to show it to all our project partners and they will have feedback. So it will probably change a little bit there as well. Well, it's mostly done. If you do quality of life stuff, feel free to grab it and have your way with it. And that's it. I'll check you guys later. Bye-bye.